Hi, in this video we've got some topics related to microscopes and in a lot of videos and in particular on the microscope videos I get asked what is the best attachment to use for the camera that's plugged into the trinocular port and I've tried a few different types. The best ones that I've found and the one that's currently on my unscope is very similar to this one here. I have found these on the Ekins AliExpress website and they very kindly sent them to me so that I could have a play with them. So we've got a 0.5 and a 0.35 times camera attachment. Um, you do have to be careful of whether these are the correct type to fit the camera port on your microscope, but they do have a few different types. So we'll have a little look at these and what the difference is between the 0.5 and the 0.35, because people do often get confused, and there is a trade-off in image quality. So we'll have a little look at that later in the video. The other thing is related to lighting. Now I've got one of those really basic ring lights on my microscopes at the moment. Those are really quite poor because the ring is sort of not much bigger than the lens itself. And what that means is the light just reflects straight off the PCB and straight back up into the camera and you end up with some really washed out parts. Now you can get around that with using polarizing lenses but what you really need is a polarizing lens where you can independently adjust the polarizer on the LEDs and on the actual lens going into the camera and those turn out to be quite expensive. So what I thought I'd have a play with is potentially building my own ring light. So I did get some PCBs made at JLC PCB. Unfortunately the main component is missing and that is the hole in the middle so that we can mount it to the microscope. So we're going to have to drill that out by hand. But what I wanted to test is whether spreading the LEDs further out from the center made any difference. And also I just did this as sort of a quick prototype PCB. I don't know whether we're going to get enough lighting without adding some lenses and also in particular whether we need to make the LEDs face in at an angle so that it's pointing down um, at the point where the lens is pointing. So I thought today we'd just have a little play around with this and see what happens. But first of all, I think we're going to have to drill this out with a hole saw. So I've just finished drilling a 57mm hole in the PCB with just a standard hole saw. And this is the ring light that I usually use and you can see what they've done is they put th three threaded holes for these screws and these just screw in and press against the lens that sits in the middle. So on the Creality CR10S Pro I've printed a couple of parts and you can see we've got the three holes in in a similar fashion and the idea is that this slides through the hole, uh, the LED is obviously facing downwards so that holds the PCB from dropping and then we've got another piece that sits on top of this with the holes in the same place and once you start screwing the screws in it clamps the PCB in place and then obviously presses against the lens. So this is just, uh, I think it's about three millimeters wider than the lens itself and that holds everything in place. So this should work quite nicely. What I need to do now is solder in the LEDs. So we've got these Cree MX3 LEDs. They're actually three dies in each package. Uh, in this case it's 3.7 volt 350 milliamps so basically one watt per, per LED. You can get these in a slightly different configuration where it's got the three LEDs in series bringing the forward voltage up near 12 volts. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to use these ones in this case because what we've got on here is two circuits with the LEDs in series. So we've got four LEDs in series and then another four LEDs in series just brought out to a terminal block header. So today we'll use the Solder King solder paste which I received back in December and this has actually only been stored in the lab. I didn't keep it in the fridge so we'll see how it behaves after six months at room temperature. And this is the bismuth type solder, so low melting point. And I've attached it to my solder paste dispenser. And what it's doing is just forcing compressed air onto the plunger and pushing the solder paste out the nozzle. It just makes it a little bit easier to use than using a syringe uh, plunger. And we'll just place the parts with the tweezers this time. So we've got the PCB on the Yoyu 946C hot plate and what we learned last time that we used this is that the plate heats up very rapidly, far quicker than the reflow profile desires and what we ended up with was a little bit of solder balling 
around each of the components. So what I've done this time is I've looked at the profile for bismuth solder and it suggests that it should soak at about 105 degrees for 60 seconds or so before you start ramping it fully up to temperature to reflow the paste. So that's what I've done. Let's have a closer look at the joints as they progress. Right, so I've just connected up the bench power supply to the outside terminals and linked out the inner two. That means all of the LEDs are connected in series, so we should need somewhere around 26 volts to get these to illuminate. So on the bench power supply, I've just set the current to 1 milliamp. Let's see if they light up. Which they do. So we should be able to turn this all the way up to about 350 milliamps now. And yeah, those are working quite nicely. This is about 10 watts in total. So the PCB will get warm, but you can see we've got some ventilation holes to draw air through the PCB. If we do need to, we can stick some heat sinks to it. But for the testing at the moment, unless this is almost the final design, then uh, it will certainly be able to run for a few minutes before the LEDs start getting too hot. So let's attach it to the microscope and just have a look at what the light output from this actually is. So we've got the Unity UT383 here as a lux meter, and that is focused exactly on the center. So if you look through the eyepieces, you can see the little light sensor just here. And we've got the original ring light on the microscope at the moment to give us a reference to see if we've actually made any improvements or not. So at the moment, this is on full power, and we're reading somewhere in the region of 8,000 lux with the ring light on and obviously the lab lights as well. So let's try the new version and see if we can make any improvement on that. And we've got a small improvement, about one and a half thousand looks extra. This does actually fit on here really quite nicely. So uh, I do quite like that mounting method, but I think we're going to have to do a little bit more work on the LEDs. We definitely need some lenses on here. So I've got a frosted lens here that we can put over one of the LEDs and kind of position it in the right place. And you can maybe see a slight increase in light on the sensor. We're actually reading a smidge over 10,000 lux just with a frosted lens. You can see it's this one at the bottom here that I'm just waving over. And without, you can see quite a difference in the amount of light there. I've also got a Fresnel type lens that I can poke over that same one. And that makes quite a noticeable difference. There's a little bit of fringing on the LED colour. You can see a bit of yellow appearing there. And we're reading about 13,000 lux on the lux meter. Finally, we've got a 15 degree lens. And if we poke that there... I can't quite... There we go. That makes a huge difference. Again, a little bit of yellowing around the edges... But now we're reading about uh, 16,000 lux, so really quite a lot of light appearing on the sensor now. For those wondering about the thermal situation, this PCB has been on for about 10 minutes now. We're dumping 10 watts into it, and it's nowhere near as bad as I thought it might be actually. It's about 55 degrees, 56, which isn't too bad given that we've got no active cooling. Basically all we've got is these thermal vias which are allowing air to pass through and cool the PCB through convection. And then we've also got copper all over the board to help spread the heat and allow um, an easy transition to the air. So not too bad at all. And I almost forgot one of the main reasons that I wanted to design my own ring light, aside from adding more brightness, was to try and stop quite so much glare and reflection on the components by widening the gap between the lens and the LEDs. And as you can see, we're getting some really nice quality images here of the resistors with no glare coming back. So those are working really quite nicely. And that means that we don't have to use the polarizing lenses. So we've got the Ekins microscope here in front of the camera. And what we've got here is the default attachment that comes with it for mounting your camera to it. So it's got this little knob that you can use to slide the camera up and down 
and that adjusts the focus. So if we take a look at what's actually being shown by the camera, you can see we can adjust the focus here. And that's the sort of image quality that we're getting through that um, camera attachment. Now, if we have a look through the eyepieces, what you can actually see is the whole of the edge of that USB connector. So that is what we're seeing through the eyepiece. But then when we have a look at what we're looking at the camera, we're only seeing about that much field of view. So we're losing quite a lot through that adapter. And I think we're also losing quite a bit of detail and also some light. You can see there's a bit of graininess. And if we move the PCB around, the camera is struggling because the shutter rate is quite slow in order to get enough light onto the sensor. So the mounting on these is pretty straightforward. There's a little grub screw at the side and that whole thing just comes off and then we can drop in the pancake lens into here. And you just tighten up that grub screw again and that's held in place. And then simply the camera just screws into the top of that mount and that's that in place. Now, one thing to note is the orientation of the camera does obviously affect what you're looking at in terms of the angle of the image. So the nice thing about that grub screw mount is that we can loosen it off a little bit and then when we find the correct position for the camera which is usually somewhere around here we can tighten that up and that's all in place. So on these what we've got is a little focusing ring just here and the nice thing about this one is that the camera stays absolutely fixed and locked into position so we can just easily adjust the focus without the whole thing twisting around and also the camera is fixed in place. On this previous lens arrangement uh, this whole thing could twist around and basically if your wires were in the way or caught on something it would twist the camera around and ruin your image. So we'll just focus this up by adjusting the little ring. That looks pretty good there. And I would say, let me see, let's count the pins on here instead. So we're probably seeing about two thirds of the image there with the half times lens. So we're seeing a little bit more than the previous attachment but we're certainly not seeing exactly what we're seeing through the eyepieces. And then finally here we are with the 035 times lens on the microscope. And as you can see, it's now matching exactly what we can see in the eyepiece. So I said we can see previously from ground to ground, and that is exactly what we're seeing through the eyepiece. So this all matches up. The main problem with the 0.35 lens is that the straight edges start to appear to have a slight curve. It looks like this center part is slightly closer to the camera than all of the extremities. And you can probably see that by looking at the top here on the straight line. It just looks here like the image is slightly bending out slightly. But other than that, the image quality with the 0.35 times lens is absolutely perfect. This looks really nice and you get quite a lot of light through this lens as well. So this does work very nicely indeed. And this is actually the one that I usually use on my Amscope microscope. So this is quite a good choice and I've never really had any problems with it. So a quick word about the cameras as well. Now what I normally use on my main microscope is a Sony IMX290 autofocus camera from Ekins and that one works really well, gives very nice image quality but you really don't need the autofocus. In fact, I always leave it turned off because it causes more problems uh, than it tries to solve because once you're using it on a trinocular microscope, you're looking through the eyepiece anyway so you need to adjust the focus and then the camera should follow suit if you've got it set up properly. So you don't need the autofocus feature. Now the IMX290 is quite old and there are some better sensors for low light use and I'm probably going to take a look at one of the new ones in the future. But you can get really good results from the much cheaper cameras. These are all under $100 at the moment. The blue one is the one that I typically use and I think it's the one that I originally had on my microscope and the link for this one is down below in the description. But this one works really nice. You get 1080p images out, 60 frames per second, records to an SD card and this one works really well. Similarly, this one has slightly more capability when it comes to capturing still images but once you've got it plugged into a HDMI capture card or something like that then uh, there's not any real difference that I've noticed between these. The pink one was slightly lower resolution recording to SD card but the same out the HDMI port so uh, you know they, they all seem to give pretty much the same image quality it doesn't seem to matter which one you go for. Now one thing that I did find in particular with the orange camera 
is that I couldn't always get the image in focus when I had it mounted to one of those lenses. And the reason being is that you do need a certain amount of distance between the sensor and that lens that's in the camera mount. And although you can undo the little grub screw and screw this in a bit out a little bit, it can only go so far before it drops out. So I wasn't able to get this camera in focus originally. And these little adapters are basically what you need. These are C to CS mount camera adapters. You can find them really cheap. I think I just picked these up on eBay for something like 70p. And what you do is you screw these in to the inner ring. And it's basically like a male to female coupler. And you can just, again, screw whatever you were going to screw into this um, in exactly the same way. It just adds that sort of 5mm distance, which is normally all you need if, you, if you're having any focusing issues. You can stack more together. And what that does is change the depth of field. Uh, sorry, it changes the field of view that you're seeing through the camera, but I've never needed to do that. But you can use that to manipulate your images as well. But these are really cheap and will almost certainly solve any problems that you're having getting your camera set up properly on your trinocular microscope. So hopefully that information about the lenses and the cameras is useful to those of you who are trying to improve the image quality or who are trying to set up their microscope for the first time. Certainly it's taken a few rounds to get some decent equipment, but I'm pretty much there and I'm quite happy with the setup that I've got, apart from the lighting. And that's why I'm addressing that with my own solution. I did have a look at some various other solutions, but they're all similar. You know, LEDs quite close to the center, and that does seem to cause a problem. You can buy the ones with the polarizing ring, but those come in at about £200. And again, they're still not all that bright. And so a custom solution, in my opinion, is a better way. And this mounting works really well. I'm quite impressed with how this turned out, actually, considering it didn't take very long to do. But the PCB needs attention. Basically, these LEDs can output light at such a wide angle that we're wasting so much energy on the bench. We really need to have these focused inwards slightly and probably a collimating lens so that we've just got the center area here that's illuminated. Now, one idea that I was toying with is perhaps getting a flexi-rigid PCB made, whereby in the center we've got a ring that maybe has all of the LED regulators and all that kind of stuff on it. Then we've got some flexes between that and another PCB, maybe eight of them around with only one LED on each. And that would mean that we can angle the LEDs or whatever we want to. It just depends on how we fix the PCB to, uh, you know, it's, its structure that's going to hold it in place on the microscope. We could even get a 3D thing made out of aluminium and that would provide the heat sinking as well, which would be quite nice. So I may give that a go, try some of the other services that some of these PCB suppliers offer and see how it all pans out. So let me know your thoughts in the comments down below if you've got any ideas or suggestions. Now, for those of you who have voted for me already in JLC PCB's competition, thank you very much. We got way higher than I ever thought we would have done, but that means now that the top three position is in sight. So if you haven't voted already and you do have a JLC PCB account, please consider voting. The link is in the description down below. You can vote for more than one person as well, but if we get one of those top few places, we can do a giveaway on JLC PCB vouchers and potentially also a giveaway just from me from some stuff from the channel. So, um, you know, if you can consider voting on the link in the description down below. Hopefully you found this video useful and until next time, thanks for watching.